engage with our presenters today. And so without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce this team um, who are my colleagues, and I'm very excited to hear about their work today. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Jen Kim Mozaleski, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences um, in the School of Medicine, and she's also core faculty at the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. Uh, Maddie is a research project ma manager um, at the PRCHN, working with Dr. Mo Kim Mozaleski. And Pat Hardy is a community health worker at the Institute for Hope at Metro Health. And we will hear more about their roles in this work as we go forward. So with that, I am going to uh, stop my share and hand the presentation over to Jen. Thank you so much. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, I trust that everybody can see the slides and if not, you will speak up and let us know. Uh, thank you everybody for making the time and being here today to hear about our research. Um, I'm presenting along with Madeline Cassell and Patricia Hardy and it's the three of us presenting today, but we are here on behalf of a, lar a much larger team who've been playing various roles in this study throughout. So I want to acknowledge them from the outset and also acknowledge them at the end once again, but to let you all know that the three of us are just a small part of this larger, larger work. We're also thankful to the CTSC, the Cleveland Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative for funding this pilot study. So the general outline for this research, I want to say from the outset that we just finished data collection less than two weeks ago. So this is brand new information that we're also processing and really excited to share with you all. And so today we're going to talk about what motivates this research, what did we actually do in this study, what have we found so far, um, what else have we learned so far, and what's coming up next. So this is going to be the general outline of today's presentation. Uh, in terms of what motivates this research, I often start with talking about tobacco use disparities along with, uh, by these income lines. So as you can see, we know that the Surgeon General's report has acknowledged that we've really come a long ways into reducing adult tobacco use in the U.S. And yet we still have a far ways to go when it comes to disparities by certain sociodemographic groups. And here I'm highlighting uh, tobacco use disparities by income. I often show this because it is so easy to see the gradient in smoking prevalence by income, whether it's any tobacco product use, any combustible product use, or cigarettes, cigarettes which happen to be the most commonly used form of tobacco. So it's very clear to see that there is this income gradient in who is smoking the most. You know, there are a lot of barriers to quitting for people who smoke. And I want to emphasize here too that most people, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their income, they want to quit and they try to quit. And yet where we do see some of the disparities in current smoking prevalence is has to do with who is able to successfully quit. And so there are a lot of barriers to quitting for particularly for low-income people who smoke, and these are just some of them. And they're really interconnected with one another. It's not really just one piece that's driving uh, the, the disparities in smoking and the disparities in quitting, but it's a multitude of these factors. So I'm highlighting here access to evidence-based cessation treatment and use of evidence-based cessation treatment, along with one social environment, which I'm construing quite broadly. So social environment could be anything around neighborhood and built environment or access to tobacco, where you, what you, where you live, what you're exposed to. Of course, um, the tobacco industry's malicious effects on and targeting on specific neighborhoods and socio-demographic groups can also go into the social environment piece. Um, access to smoke-free policies or even like normative smoking in one social circle. So related to that is social supports for quitting. Another kind of big bucket for barriers to quitting has to do with exposure to life stress, chronic stress, and living with unmet social needs. So I wanted to really just kind of highlight this broad um, intersection of these factors as we talk about what we did in this research and, and why we did this. A little bit more about food insecurity and, and kind of as an unmet social need that impacts smoking. So 
I just want to say at the outset today, we're going to kind of dive right into this food insecurity and smoking relationship. But for those who want more background information about this, I, we did a presentation for the Prevention Research Center last year, it was May 2022, and that presentation is uh, available on our YouTube channel and on our uh, website, where you can find a lot more where I dive quite deeply into the food insecurity and smoking relationship. But to give, start off with the definition of what is food insecurity, so it, it occurs when access to enough food for an active healthy living is limited or uncertain due to a lack of money or other resources. Um, and food insecurity at the national level affects around 10 to 11% of US households. There are also different levels of food insecurity where people can be moderately or severely food insecure, also sometimes called um, low food security or very low food security, and I'll come back to that in a future slide. And to kind of dive right into the food insecurity and smoking relationship, we know from a whole host of studies that there is a disproportionately high prevalence of food insecurity among people who smoke cigarettes or use tobacco and, and vice versa. And this is a fairly robust finding that's based on multiple epidemiological studies that have been conducted over the past decade, both cross-sectional and longitudinal work. And the longitudinal work also shows that change in one of these factors, whether it's food insecurity or smoking, independently predicts change in the other. So whether you control for other indicators of socioeconomic status or um, sociodemographic characteristics. So as I mentioned, there are different levels of food insecurity. Some, most, most of the time they look at food secure versus food insecure, but there are different levels. And what we know also from the literature is that uh, as food insecurity severity increases, so does the prevalence of smoking. So you're seeing on the left-hand side, this graph showing that among those who are high, low, or very low food security, there is a gradient again in who is smoking. And what's really striking is that those with very low food security, also known as severe food insecurity, half of them in the US population are currently smoking cigarettes. So to say a little bit more about how, what is the relationship between food insecurity? Why do we care about food insecurity in terms of smoking? And especially for smoking cessation, this is a graphic that I hope will kind of illustrate this point a little bit further. So I'll start from the left-hand side of panel A that you see in gray. And so this is what we find in literature on food insecurity and its consequences on health. Um, we know that food insecurity is a risk factor for food insufficiency, not having enough to eat, feeling hungry because there is not enough to eat. And so some of the indicators of food insecurity or measures of food insecurity have to do with skipping meals um, or going a whole day without eating because of not enough money for food. So we know that that's one of the consequences of food insecurity. We also know that poor mental health, stress, symptoms of depression and anxiety are also common among people who are experiencing food insecurity. Worry is one of the hallmarks of food insecurity. And then lastly, I put here some of the decisional trade-offs that occur with food insecurity. So uh, there's a wide body of literature on food insecurity and chronic diseases and its impact on chronic diseases. And in those studies, what folks find is that people are either um, trading in, the, let's say the quantity versus the quality of food, you know, or they're making trade-offs in terms of quality so that they can get enough to eat. Um, there's also a lot of work on, let's say medication adherence, where people are making decisions around, do they afford medicine this month or do they afford to have enough food? So these are some of the decisional trade-offs. And I wanna emphasize on this left panel, this isn't everything related to consequences of food insecurity. These are the ones that we are looking at when it comes to what could be relevant for smoking and smoking cessation. So now if we go to panel B on the orange side, we know um, that when there is hunger involved, people may use cigarettes and due to nicotine to cope with hunger. And we found this through qualitative research um, and other types of studies that kind of show this link. And in terms of poor mental health, smoking, when you ask people, you know, why are you smoking or what are some of the major reasons as to why you smoke, what are some of the barriers to quitting, uh, smoking to cope with stress comes up a lot. And then lastly, for decisional trade-offs, it could also be that, as I mentioned, most people want to quit and they're motivated to quit. And yet, if they're in the midst of all of these kind of uncertainties or instabilities in their life, that smoking cessation becomes deprioritized. It's important, but maybe it's not right now. It's something that 
somebody would want to do later when their situations become more stable or their food needs are addressed. So this is more on the kind of the driving impetus behind this work. So for this pilot study, we uh, partnered with Metro Health Institute for Hope at, to get this pilot funding from the CPSC. And so for those who, many folks here are from Metro Health, but I'll give a quick um, overview of Metro Health. It is our county safety net hospital that serves a high proportion of um, people in our county who are on Medicaid, low income, and it's our uh, safety net hospital. And in 2019, Metro Health created the Institute for Hope, which stands for Health Opportunity Partnership and Empowerment. And this was efforts to really not just screen people for different kinds of social drivers or social needs that are unmet, but screen and refer them to various services to address things that are beyond kind of the clinical aspect, but we know are tied to patient outcomes. So we partnered with, with uh, Metro Health for this work, and we kind of we prior to doing this pilot study, we did a secondary analysis of electronic health records and social need screening data of Metro Health primary care patients. So I'm showing the publication to the right, which was published in 2022 in Preventive Medicine Reports. Um, I also want to put in a plug here that Metro Health has been a leader in really screening and referring. And so last year in October and November, they led a series of webinars from the American Heart, uh, sorry, American Hospital Association about kind of using referrals, how to refer, how to screen, how to refer. And so that's all publicly available as well those uh, recordings from that webinar. But in the study, uh, it included over 45,000 patients who were seen in primary care from 2019 to 2021. And we started in 2019 for this study because that's when folks began to be, be um, regularly screened for various social needs. And just one of the findings from this particular publication was that smoking prevalence for those who were food insecure was double that of those who were food secure. And this is, this mirrors kind of the patterns that we see in other national studies. And that in logistic regression analyses, we found that food insecurity independently increased the odds of current smoking as well as continued smoking. So when we looked at those who were ever smokers, so current smokers or former smokers, it seemed like it was, it was associated with continued smoking, which is an indicator of not quitting smoking. So in terms of the overall research goals here, I'm using this kind of funnel analogy to say, we, we did this small pilot study, but we have these kind of bigger goals. So if we start from the bottom of this funnel, in this particular research, we, our aim was to design and conduct a pilot study to examine the feasibility and acceptability of addressing short-term food insecurity while people are attempting to quit. Um, and we want to be really realistic here that we weren't trying to, you know, solve food insecurity as a societal issue, although that would be fantastic to do. And this was really to address short term food insecurity. Um, one of the kind of analogies I can give is that if you've ever tried to start a new exercise regimen or a new diet regimen, you know that it takes a lot of mental effort, it takes a lot of kind of consistency. And if you're also dealing with things like stressors, whether it's food insecurity, financial strain, those or interpersonal stress, whatever stress that you might have in your life, it's harder to do those things. So our goal here was to address short-term food insecurity, which we know is a barrier to quitting while people are trying to undergo a quit attempt. And sort of the second level, second level research goal that we hope that this feeds into is how can we understand in targeting food insecurity as a potential strategy to promote successful quitting, given the socioeconomic disparities in quitting. And then lastly, of course, we have this big picture goal of, can we address social needs to eliminate tobacco-related health disparities? I'll go a little bit now into the pilot study design. So we used an RCT, or randomized control design, that lasted about 12 weeks or three months. And our target population in the study were Metro Health adult primary care patients who currently smoke cigarettes, are considered food insecure, and are ready to quit. So we really, for this pilot, engage with people who are motivated to quit, ready to quit, willing to set a quit attempt. In terms of the treatment arm, we had two treatment arms. The first one we're calling standard of care, or we're, we'll also uh, refer to that as the control arm, and I'll give more information about that. 
and versus a standard of care plus an additional food insecurity intervention, which we'll call as the intervention group going forward. So what was standard of care? It was screening and referring folks who are food insecure for food assistance and for smoky cessation resources that are also smoking. And this was done by a community health navigator community health worker who was serving as a study navigator. And you can see this wonderful picture of Pat, who's, who's uh, this is in Metro Health Materials, and she'll be speaking with us shortly. Um, there are a number of roles that community health workers may, may play in a primary care setting or in community health settings. And for this particular study, we were looking really to kind of in the, in the realm of providing social support, kind of this informal social support from somebody who's connected to the healthcare system and knows how to navigate the healthcare system. Of course, resource linking for food assistance and tobacco cessation, and then following up on some of those resources. So I, I don't mean to say that, you know, there's a lot of things that community health workers do, and this is just what we targeted in our particular study. Now, in terms of the food insecurity intervention, before I, I give the details around that, I just wanted to make this important point that, you know, food insecurity is a really complex issue. And so, again, we don't mean to imply that we were solving food insecurity in this particular pilot study, although that would have been just um, an amazing thing to do. But it occurs, there's a lot of structural inequities that happen that then continue to give us problems when it relates to food insecurity. So given the complexity of food insecurity, people experience food insecurity really differently too, whether that can like wax and wane over time or whether it's, it has to do with the, um, the severity of food insecurity. So people do vary greatly in how to meet their needs around food or what really is the precursor to food insecurity, whether it's like employment or unemployment that's driving food insecurity. There's, it's a highly complex issue, but really by definition, there is a lack of money and resources that drive food insecurity. So with that said, our economic intervention or our food insecurity intervention entailed an economic intervention. And one that can be used flexibly. So this was again short term because it was within the confines of this pilot study and to alleviate food insecurity and the related stress that comes with that while people were undergoing a smoking cessation attempt. Uh, Maddie is going to say more about this in the future slide, but it was really important for us that we keep this food insecurity and economic intervention to be flexible so it's not restricted to just food or groceries only. And you may then think, well, how is that food insecurity? And yet the way that we approach this was to say, sometimes you know, people need to be able to have access to funds that can be used flexibly so that their food access needs can be addressed. So perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a you know, gas bill for a car or gas pay, putting, you know, filling up your tank that's really needed. So, and that's gonna be what's gonna help alleviate food insecurity. So we were keeping this fairly flexible in providing an economic intervention. Last thing I'll say is that this was done fully remotely. So we designed the study starting in late 2020 and then early 2021. And so because of that, the timing of that, we just kept everything fully remote from the outset and um, just wanted everybody to be aware of that. And so the questions that we were addressing in this pilot study Foremost, um, the primary outcomes were in examining feasibility. Can we do this? And acceptability. Is this acceptable to the participants who participate? And then as a secondary finding, we wanted to look at the preliminary impact of this intervention on indicators of smoke cessation as well as food insecurity after this 12-week intervention. And so for the, the secondary outcomes, we were examining whether somebody made a 24-hour quit attempt during this study, what was the longest length of abstinence from smoking throughout participating in this study, and what about the food insecurity indicators pre and post. So with that, now I'm going to turn this over to Madeline Castell, who, as uh, Dr. Trappel mentioned, is our research project manager, and she's going to walk you through some of the methods of this particular study. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, so as Jen said, I'm going to talk about the methods used to uh, recruit participants, um, explain some more about our study activities, and then give more details about um, our economic intervention. 
So with the help of the Institute for Help at Metro Health, we were able to use electronic health records to pre-screen potential participants and filter based on um, individual criteria. So um, our inclusion criteria includes obviously anyone who's a Metro Health patient, um, and they must have had a primary care visit in the last three to six months to be included in this list. Um, they must be over 21, currently smoking, and then also screen positive for food insecurity. So once we have that list all together, we sent mailers to those potential participants' residencies. So each of these mailers contained a consent memo that they got to keep and a study flyer with their, uh, our contact information for the study. Uh, we use our we use passive, both passive and proactive outreach um, and contacting potential participants. So meaning that they could call us whenever they would like to, and then we also called them after a period of time. Um, so once we got into contact with a potential participant who was interested in the study, we did our own eligibility screening our, our, on our end to make sure they were officially eligible for the study. Um, there were specific eligibility criteria on, on our end. So in order to be officially eligible for the study, they had to uh, live in Cuyahoga County, be currently smoking cigarettes and interested in quitting for at least 24 hours in the next month. Um, they either had to screen positive for food insecurity using our two item U.S. Department of Agriculture screener or have visited a food pantry in the last 30 days. Um, participants also had to be a primary food shopper for their household, so it had to do at least half of the food shopping. Um, once we determined that um, our participant was eligible, um, we invited them to do a verbal consent and then we also invited them to take their first survey. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a schedule of study activities. Um, once folks complete the baseline survey and then they could take the survey either over the phone or online. So once they complete that, they're officially enrolled into the study and then that kicks off the rest of their um, the schedule for their study activities. So um, everything is referenced a number of weeks after the baseline, as you can see on this table. So uh, one week after baseline is when randomization occurs. So that's when they're put into either the control group or the intervention group. And that's also when they uh, have their first phone call with Pat. So this is their intake phone conversation when they talk about resources. They also um, have two more follow-ups with Pat um, spread about four weeks apart. And I'll let Pat explain more about um, what exactly goes on during these phone conversations um, in a later slide as it, there's a lot that is covered in those conversations. Um, around weeks 12 to 13 is when our follow-up survey occurs. So that is pretty much identical to the baseline survey. Um, it's where we measure a lot of our outcome data from. And lastly, um, this was this last activity was not available to everybody, but some of our participants in the intervention group were invited to do a qualitative interview with the research team. And this was done after the trials already ended, just to discuss some of their um, experiences being part of the study. Uh, we wanted to include them in our study activities as well. Um, so besides the qualitative interview, um, all these activities were done with the control and the intervention group um, simultaneously. However, um, while both groups were paid for both the baseline survey and the follow-up surveys, um, the folks in the intervention group received slightly more economic assistance throughout the study, um, and with, I'll discuss that more right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so before I get into the economic intervention, I did want to mention that we did have to make an adjustment in the type of incentive we wanted to offer. Originally, we were using a reloadable debit card that would be sent to participants once, and then we would reload reload money onto it via an online system. So they would just have one card and we would load money onto it remotely and they could just keep using that card. Um, however, the vendor for the debit cards fell through. So we switched over to using non reloadable Visa gift cards instead. Um, so even though the type of incentive changed, the amount we gave participants did not change and the core purpose of the economic intervention did not change. Um, so that, as you can see what's pictured on the slide here, this is what our visa cards look like. So we had a little sticker with our with the Metro Health Institute for Hope logo and then our PRCHN logo on it. Um, so we gave participants in the intervention group a total of $250 spread across the 12 weeks of the study, which comes out to about $80 a month. And there is a specific reason why we went with that amount. The USDA publishes cost of food estimates about every month um, at several levels. So this includes thrifty, low, 
uh, moderate and liberal. So this amount covers about one week's worth of food at the moderate level. And this is important because folks that may go to a store that's not a full service grocery store, say they go to a corner store, that may be the store that's closest to their residence. Um, they may end up paying more for the same groceries. So it's, a, it is, it's an attempt to even that out. Um, for this intervention, we encourage participants as much as possible to use gift cards to help supplement their grocery costs. Um, but as Jen said, this is not um, this is not substitute just groceries and food. It's they can purchase household items with it. They can purchase any um, you know gas, uh, bus fares, any travel related needs as well. Um, and then additionally, we were able to access their transactions online. So this is something really cool we were able to do. Um, so with participants' permission, we were able to access their transactions so we can see what store they went to using the card and then how much they spent using it. So we can able to see um, a lot of a lot of their spending patterns um, and where they where they went to in regards to how far from their residence they were able to go. So there's a lot of really valuable data that we'll we'll get from um, these transaction data. Um, as Jen will mention later. Um, we're still in the data collection phase of this portion though, so no results yet, but very exciting to see in the future. Um, so right now I'm gonna hand it over to Pat, who's going to explain a little bit more about what happens um, during her referral calls with um, other participants. Hello everyone, um, thank you, Maddie. Um, so basically I, was the contact person to speak with each of the participants. So as Maddie mentioned, it was three calls made to each participant over a 12 week period. The first call, which can be called the resource call, is where I introduce myself and the reasons for the call and what they can expect from me. If you wanna really look at it, it's like getting to know somebody before you fully commit to dating them. So that's how I look at that. Um, so the information I provided was dealing with smoking resources. So if they were interested, I explained to them the, about the Ohio Quit Buying, a program here at Metro Health called Freedom From Smoking. That's a group um, program where they work together in a group through the quitting process. And then there's a nicotine replacement therapy program that's also here at Metro Health. Um, I will also reach out to their PCP if they were interested and let them know that the individual is interested in some form of medication, such as whether it be patches or gum um, or Wellbutrin or even um, Chantex. And I reach out to the PCP to let them know that they're interested. If possible, if the patient is pretty much okay with it, I will schedule an appointment for them with the PCP. Um, if I see that they already had an appointment scheduled, then I just shoot this PCP a message to let them know that the patient, that the participant is interested. And then from there, um, I would also remind the participant to speak with the PCP at their appointment visit. Um, I also will ask them if they were interested in receiving any form of self-help self material. And if they were, that information was sent to Maddie for that um, information to be sent out to the participant. Um, also with my role, I do focus a lot with patient, with participants with food insecurity. So um, I am very adamant to make sure that their food resources are top notch and they have what they need as far as um, the food resources that are available. So I will often put referrals through to Unite Us. That's our, um, I'm sorry, my mind is going blank. That is our um, platform that we use to send referrals to different organizations to help patients, participants with specific needs. So one of them that I use a lot was the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. If the participant agreed to a referral there, I would get their consent to sign on their behalf to send the referral to unite us to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. I will also see if they'd be interested in receiving any food pantries within their zip codes. If they were, I will mail that information out to their home. There is also a program that's called Food as Medicine that's here at Metro Health, and it's a medical-based program that provides healthy foods for eligible patients. Eligibility is based on having a mental health primary care doctor, 
screening positive for food insecurity, um, high A1C above seven, high blood pressure 150 over 100 or greater, or recent admission into a hospital with a um, worsening episode of heart failure. After reviewing the participant charts, if I saw that they met the qualifications for the program, then I see if they would want to participate in the program. If they were, if they wanted to participate, I would sign them up and get them registered as well. Um, we also, I also offer produce perks and explain that program to them. That's a program that's offered at Mark's, at, I'm sorry, at um, Dave's supermarket, where if the participant spent $10 I believe it's ten dollars for um, fresh produce. Then, in return for their next shopping visit, they will get a token for ten dollars for their next visit. With the produce perks, they can also use it at different um, food stands, farmers markets as well. Any additional resources that they may need, I will get them connected as well. So, although they may, they were in a program for smoking resources, for smoking and food resources. If I hear they mention something that they need to help with something else, I've got them connected to those resources as well too. So it wasn't just about making sure that they recover for smoking and food. The second and third call um, I follow, was a follow-up to make sure that everything went okay as far as the referrals that I placed for them. If for whatever reason they tell me that they did not hear back or get in contact with any other resources I sent, the referrals I sent, then I would make sure I follow up on it to see exactly what's going on. Um, and I know that they were like really looking forward to the second call. So I made, I had to make sure that I was on what I'm doing to contact the patients, the participants for um, these, the second and third call because they, would tell me, I've been waiting on your call. So, <laughs> and knowing that they're waiting on my call was, you know, something good. And it was very pleasurable speaking with these participants. Thank you so much, Pat. With that, we're going to show some of our preliminary results at this point. I'm going to hand it back to Maddie. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, so yeah, so we'll move on to the results for the pilot study. Um, as, as Jen mentioned earlier, these results are brand new. We just finished data collection at the end of April, actually. So pretty, their results are pretty fresh. Um, so we'll focus these results mostly on enrollment, uh, participant characteristics, and our overall main findings um, as they relate to just the primary outcomes. So this, as you can see here, this is a flow chart looking at how we got to our final number of participants and then the retention rate of the participants um, in both the control and intervention group. So looking onto the flow chart on the left side, um, 567 was our number of um, pre-screened recruitment pools. So that was the list that original list that we started from that we sent mailers to. Um, we actively talked to 221 of those individuals. So that's about 40%. Um, and then going down further down the flow chart, about 126 of those 126 of those intervals got to the screening process. That's about 60 percent of that 221. Um, about 66 people were um, deemed eligible for the study, so that's about that's a little bit more than half um, of that 126. And then finally, we got to the our 55 enrolled participants who completed our baseline. Um, so moving on to the flow chart on the right side. So um, the 55 participants we enrolled were randomly split between the control group and intervention group. So that's how it was split. Um, so control group had 27 participants, intervention at 28. So you can see down the line for each of those participants how many um, completed each of these study activities. So as you can kind, you can kind of already tell that the intervention group did complete slightly more activities than the control group. And Jen will talk a bit more about that when we talk about our lessons learned. Um, in our lessons learned section. Um, but I will say that about 70% of the control group completed all activities through the follow-up and about 90% of the intervention group completed activities through the follow-up. So there is a discrepancy there. All right, next slide. Thank you. 
Um, so this is a table that looks at participant characteristics at the time of their baseline survey. So we have um, mean age, gender, race, education, income, and marital status. Uh, due to time constraints, I won't be able to go through all of these numbers individually, um, but we did want to show in this table and the following two tables that I'll talk about that the, there were no significant differences between the control group and the intervention group in terms of these characteristics. So that's a really good thing. It means that the um, randomization process worked and that the two groups were essentially the same. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this table looks at baseline characteristics in terms of smoking and smoking cessation. Um, so we have mean number of cigarettes smoked per day, mean number of years smoked regularly, uh, percent that have had a cessation attempt in the past three months, percent that ever used evidence-based cessation strategies, and then the mean number of evidence-based strategies tried. So I will say for this last row um, that this number is out of five. So each participant was presented with five different evidence-based strategies, um, and they were to select which one or ones that they have tried. Um, so this number is out of five. Oh, thank you. Um, so these are the baseline characteristics as related to um, food. Um, so we the categories for this are uh, percent that have used a food pantry, percent that have higher marginal food security, low food security, or very low food security, and then percent that have received um, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or food stamps um, at baseline. Um, so at this point, I'm going to head it hand it back to Jen to discuss some of our other main findings from the pilot um, as far as baseline and follow-up comparisons go. So it would be really exciting to look at. Thank you. All right. So here we go. We're going to look at this brand new data on smoking behaviors at follow-up. The caveat here is that, again, this is kind of preliminary and we're looking at it as a complete case analysis. So that means the numbers are going to be biased more positively than when it would be if we looked at all participants. And I can explain a little bit more about that here or in the Q&A. Um, this one, I do want to I do want to note that on the left hand side, the percent that made a quit attempt, this does seem to be something around this. We found this effect where at baseline, there was a difference between the control group and the intervention group on who made a quit attempt in the past, in reference to the past three months prior to enrollment. But what you can see from baseline to follow up is that both groups did increase in making a quit attempt, but that increase was steeper for the intervention group. When we look at the length of the longest quit attempt or length of abstinence in days, these are all self-reported as well. Um, we can see that somehow those in the intervention group slightly at baseline had a longer length of quit attempt in, the, in reference to the past three months. But what we see at follow-up is that those folks in the baseline stayed pretty much the same around nine days. Whereas those in the those in the intervention group went from um, went from 12 days to 19 days, and so it was a much steeper increase in the longest length of abstinence self-reported. A little bit more about smoking behaviors at follow-up. The left-hand side is showing cigarettes per day. So here, the control group just slightly one to two more cigarettes per day at baseline compared to the intervention group, but and you can see that both groups dropped, but it seemed to have dropped more steeply for the intervention group who went down to, went down from about 12 and a half to about seven cigarettes per day. Um, so we saw improvements for both groups, but it was a more marked improvement in the intervention group. On the right-hand side, I'm showing those as a proxy for smoking cessation. So this wasn't a study where we did like biochemical verification of smoking status as many smoking cessation studies may do, but this, since this was a feasibility and, and acceptability study, we looked at kind of cigarettes per day at follow-up. Um, on the left-hand side, this is those who are complete case. So everybody that completed the study, you can see um, this big difference between the, the control and the intervention group. And on the right hand side, if we're using this intention to treat, which assumes that for those who dropped out throughout the study, that no, there's no change in their cigarettes per day from baseline, you can see that that pattern still holds, even though those numbers are, are slightly reduced, as we would expect. So this is an area where we have a lot more work to do and a lot more analyses to conduct to say, okay, when you control for a number of factors, such as um, baseline quit attempt, do we continue to see this association and so on? So stay tuned for that in future future um, presentations and publications. 
Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're finding so far and food insecurity change. So as I mentioned, there's different levels of food insecurity and Maddie showed the, um, showed the baseline characteristic, which is also kind of shown here on the left-hand side. At baseline, we can see that 55% of our samples had very low food security or severe food insecurity. Another third had low food security. And then about 11% were considered to be high or marginal food security. At follow-up, you can see these kind of categories shifting a little bit, where more folks are now in this like high or marginal food security and in the low food security category, and there's a diminishment of the very low food security category. In the next slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of disaggregate this baseline all by group, by control and intervention. So just pay attention to the left three left-hand side. So this is just to give you a snapshot that perhaps there's a some group differences here. We're not quite sure yet on this, but I wanted to just disaggregate this and show it to you to say it's about, you know, half the sample had very low food security from the outset, and it didn't too much vary based on group in terms of the very low food security part. Now, on the right-hand side, now we're looking at follow-up in terms of control and follow-up for the intervention group on the categories and just drawing your attention to this very low food security um, section. As I said, there's a lot more work to be done, but really what it seems like so far based on, based on just our first look at this is that there seems to be a reduction in very low food security prevalence. And this is for both groups had a reduction, but the reduction was a lot more marked in the intervention group versus the control group. Um, Pat was talking about very detailed information about her calls and what went on in those calls. We looked at kind of the length of calls, just as a starting point. We have a lot more information to look at and data to look at, but what we're finding is that just in the first resource call, there was a, the intervention group had on average five minutes longer than the control group. And I can say that could be just um, a part of the design that we would probably switch up in the next iteration of this study. What we had done was in the first resource call, we wanted to make sure that those who are in the intervention group receive their um, debit card or their inter economic intervention card. So we had one more prompt in, the, in, that, um, in her resource call kind of semi-structured script to ask about that. And that only went to the intervention group. So it makes sense that it's slightly a few more minutes for those in the, in the intervention group versus the control group. But as you can see in the follow-up calls, they're very similar in terms of the timing of, of those calls. And we have a lot more detailed information about kind of the referrals that folks received and kind of their use. And that's what's gonna be coming up next in our analysis. I wanted to share a little bit um, as we start to kind of wrap up, wrap up um, the initial presentation here and our initial findings. As part of our 12 week or follow up survey, we also got some qualitative feedback from participants. And so this is to get a sense of, you know, we saw change, positive change in both groups. And so in the left hand, this yellow box here, um, this participant said she looked forward to getting calls from the quit line counselors every week. They really helped. You know, they were really excited. This was a control participant. So a lot of folks, regardless of what groups they were in, got some benefit of being in the study. On the right-hand side in green, this is related to somebody's use of nicotine replacement therapy. And I highlighted this quote because this person says, my experience in quitting was stressful. When I don't smoke a lot, I eat a lot. And when I don't eat enough, I smoke. What made it easier was using the patches, but I still have not tried the gum so on. And so this is really getting at this kind of relationship between food insecurity and smoking that's coming up in our study. And the bottom left um, has to do as a couple quotes from both the intervention, somebody in the intervention group and somebody in the control group about the usefulness of receiving food pantries and food assistance um, referrals. And then lastly, as I mentioned, in terms of one of the uh, community health worker roles that we were highlighting is the importance of social support and participants in both the intervention and control group just really spoke to spoke to how 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 important it was that they didn't feel alone and you know having somebody there who's check in just receiving that check in call means a lot. So I want to highlight these both and we're we're really in the process of doing some content analysis around these. And so I'm going to talk. 
take the next few minutes to talk a little bit more about the lessons learned so far. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Pat and allow her to um, talk about her perspective and the lessons learned. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I learned through this process that it's important to meet the participants where they are. It's easy to judge them for what they, for smoking, but I learned that, and I, and I also told them that it's a no judgment zone. Um, I would share stories with them about my experiences with smoking. So that put it at ease for them as well, knowing that they're actually talking to someone that used to be a smoker and know what it's like to smoke and know how hard it is to smoke. Um, also, when I put referrals into the food bank or offered to send them referrals for the soup food banks, a lot of participants would say, no, not to send it, not because they wasn't in need, it was because they felt there were others that was that needed more so than they did. So they will often say, no, don't send it. Um, I don't wanna take food out of someone else's mouth that needed more than I do. When offering support for um, food pantries in the area, that would be either a hit or miss because if they had transportation to get there, they would accept the um, list of pantries but at the same time, if they didn't have transportation, then they would decline um, assistance for that. One instance, I had a participant who did not have any medical insurance. So I referred her to Fair Hill Partners so they can work with her with getting insurance. So she was able to get uh, medical insurance as well as SNAP benefits with me doing that. Um, and that was also work with the Greater Cleveland Food Bank too. If they didn't, were not on any type of assistance for food, I will connect them, connect them to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank so they can apply for SNAP benefits. There were participants that even that didn't even want referrals for um, quitting for freedom from smoking because um, they wanted to see what they can do first. They wanted to try it on their own or try it with just the medication to see if that would work. But I always let them know, hey, if you change your mind, you know, you can always let me know. And that would be one of my follow-up questions in the second and third call to see how they felt about the group, um, about freedom from smoking as well as the quit line if they declined it on the first call. Um, strange thing is that a lot of participants will, participants will say, well, can you refer me for hypnosis or can you refer me for acupuncture? And a lot of them understood that that is not covered by insurances. So I will just tell them, unfortunately, that is not anything I can offer as far as providing information for you. Um, and it wasn't, although they did mention it, they knew that it wasn't, wouldn't be covered by their insurance. So that kind of like, I think they were looking more for, so for more information about how it works because they may have had individuals that did it that they know and it works well for them. So them inquiring about that, just, you know, let us know as far as in the study that it may be something to look into to see if we can at least provide the information for the participants, if that's something they're willing to pay for out of their pocket instead of going to um, going through their insurance company. Um, I'm going to go ahead on and come to turn it back over to Jen. Thank you so much, Pat. I think, yeah, one of the takeaways just having talked to Pat throughout this process and seeing her engagement with the participants is that every participant has a different set of needs and really it was so important for Pat to just be on the phone with them and really work with them. While the first call, as I showed, the mean was around 30 minutes, some participants it ranged to up to 60 minutes for each of those calls. So some people really needed a lot of um, a lot of conversation, which Pat was able to provide. So we're really thankful for that. And it brings a lot of kind of perspectives as to what else we might be able to do as part of a research group or as a research study. And so from the 
additional kind of lessons learned from the research and logistical perspective. Well, first, it was this study was feasible to do, um, and it was acceptable to the participants. I didn't show a lot of the acceptability data here, but we have um, like feedback from participants on this that's being coded now, and it's like overwhelmingly positive or neutral. So we can you know, confidently say this was a feasible and acceptable study to do, while there are other kind of changes that would be recommended based on what we've learned so far. I also just wanted to highlight that there was a lot of external factors that were happening as we were under doing this study starting in early 2022, so about a, more than a year ago. And so if you can think back then, I know timelines can get fuzzy lately, but there are many things that were happening during this study, whether it was like inflation that was happening more recently, or there were gas prices that really went up last summer. Um, we know that throughout the study, the pandemic snack allotments that folks were getting were also ending. So people's food situation was like changing regardless of anything else in the study. And as Maddie mentioned, the reloadable debit card system issues, that was really out of our control. You know, this vendor went out of business. And so we really had to scramble while people were in the middle of the study to say, oh, what can we do? How can we not, you know, not um, let this affect the study as much as we could? As Maddie showed in that flow chart, there were group differences in dropout. And what became pretty clear to us was sort of it, most of the dropout happened after the baseline survey before folks talked to Pat in that first resource call. So it really gives us a perspective, okay, how do we make sure that um, people's people dropout is not affected there? Um, I also want to say overall, it was an 80% retention rate. And so that's a fairly good rate. And we are just, that's, we have a lot of improvement to do, but it's still, you know, not the worst. And then, of course, there are the usual limitations of this being a small pilot study, and that's not power to um, talk about statistically significant differences at the at the outcome. So we have a lot more work to do in this regard. So the future steps, as I've alluded to throughout the presentation, is uh, we're analyzing the findings beyond the descriptives that are presented here to really get into the nitty gritty of so much of the data that we have. And so just to give you a sense of while this is a small study of 55 participants over three months, you know, we have a several sub analyses that are underway. So that qualitative study of folks who are in the intervention group, we just even doing those interviews, we were able to pick up on a lot of different interesting themes. Um, geospatial analyses, we're exploring that in terms of where participants are living, where they're shopping, how far they were traveling, how does that affect their experiences with smoking cessation outcomes? Um, also looking more specifically at the referrals that participants accepted and used. So we kept really detailed uh, logs of every call that Pat made with both kind of um, drop down, click and data collection, as well as qualitative data collection that Pat kept throughout. And then lastly, I think a really cool piece of this study, and this is where the partnership with the Institute for Hope at Metro Health is really, I think, a unique feature of this study is that we're now doing some analyses examining the recruitment and representation of this study. So that means we were able to get 500 or 55 participants in this study out of a pool of 500 and some. And so what we do have are data on not just our demographics based on the electronic health record, but their social needs screening to say, what are these other social needs that folks had that entered the study versus those who maybe declined the study or we weren't able to reach. So that gives some information about kind of clinical trial recruitment and representation. And of course, you know, we're now refining the protocol and seeking funding for a larger trial that can help us understand, you know, if this, if we continue to see these findings, you know, what are some of the mechanisms as to why we may see um, differences in quit attempts, the length of quit attempts, and smoking cessation outcomes, food insecurity outcomes, and so on. So with that, I'm going to just acknowledge everybody once again, all the big, everybody who had any part in part of this study, the investigator team, and folks at the Institute for Hope. And I think that will now give us some time for Q&A for anybody who's interested in learning more. We're happy to open it up. I'm gonna stop the share so we can kind of see each other as we can. So Jen, I'll start. Um, hi you guys, this was wonderful to hear. 
I just, you know, we've been waiting for uh, for so long to see what what you would come up with, and if it actually, you know, the hunches are, are right, right? Whether or not this intersectionality is as strong as it seems it is. I know you have a small sample, but is there a way to break it even a little more to know? Because you you said the intervention group showed right less food insecurity in the post, so you know that the money reduced that food insecurity, right? You don't know. I mean, the question is whether they eat differently, and that's a different kind of a question, but you know that, but do you know if, is that is that difference at all associated with the outcome differences? So like, you know, not, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it, it's a mediation, right? Do you, you know, did this in fact reduce food insecurity? And for those that, in, in, you know, maybe it's a modifier, those that did in fact have a reduction, were they more likely to, to, to do a quit attempt? Yeah, Elaine, that's a really good question. And so we haven't looked at that qual quantitatively, but we have looked at that qualitatively. Granted, it was with the economic intervention sample, but by them sharing with us things like, you know, I was able to use this um, economic intervention that did help me motivate me to quit because having yeah. that kind of stress reduced. So we have some of that information, at least, that can help. That's alluding to what you're talking about. So in, in the formal mediation of what's going on. And then just one other question, did you guys, do you have a relationship with the food bank to be able to use their pantry track data to see where people use the pantries? I don't think, I don't know about that. I, what I do know is that Pat could use Unite Us to make that referral and then she can later see the kind of the disposition of the referrals. We haven't gone in to collect that data or pull that data out, but that is, I believe, available and Karen or Pat, you can please correct me if that's if I'm misspeaking. Okay. That's correct. So Jen, talk to us later, because I think there's something else you could do in the bigger study that would track this a little bit. Yeah, Elaine. And you know, the bigger study is coming. So, <laughs> or hopefully. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I see fast. Nathan's hand up. Yeah. First off, fantastic work, y'all. It's very interesting to see this kind of come to fruition. And I second what Elaine said about it. It's, it's cool to see that what y'all came up with. I had a couple pieces that I was especially interested in. Um, one was the mention about the flexibility to the benefits, which is, you know, kind of a departure from how a lot of typical safety net programs had worked for a long time, where it was more, there were more strings attached to it sometimes, um, either income requirements or work requirements, or you can only spend it on this or that, the other thing. And the other piece that you mentioned is transaction data. Um, and it occurs to me that, um, you know, when, for example, when, when the government tried stimulus checks a couple of years ago in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of people were just operating off of assumptions of how would people use the money. Uh, so I guess I was curious, um, do you, were you able to analyze the data slash are you able to comment at all on what you saw from the transaction data in terms of how people were using the money once they actually had it in their hands? Really good question. So I can say about the transaction data, two things. We only could see where they spent it and how much they spent it versus like itemized like what they bought. So we don't have that level of information on it. But the way to kind of my my take on this was there have been studies that have looked at the transaction data really don't really overwhelming because one of the criticisms that people that people can tend to kind of assume is well if you give people money that without like restricting it on what they spend it on they're going to buy more tobacco with it you know that's one of the things where they're going to buy alcohol or something and so what these studies in the past have shown that have actually looked at each thing individually is that that is not the case for most folks and we just wanted to approach this from folks are there they want to quit and they're motivated to quit let's give them some agency around what they shop for and then actually i will share this of in our um in either our follow-up qualitative end of study feedback or even in our um qualitative actual interviews we did have one or two folks say to us, you know, to tell you the truth, I did buy a pack of cigarettes with that, but that was at one time and blah, blah, blah. So then, you know, we, that's all information that we can also use to learn better. And it was really about this agency piece of let's allow folks the decision to buy what they think that they're going to need. And if sometimes during the smoking cessation process, if that 
turns out to be a pack of cigarettes, that's something else for us to learn. Yeah, I hope that answered your question, Nathan. Yeah, that makes sense. I would say just really interesting piece about the transaction data. We're really interested in where folks were shopping relative to where they were living. And this is, I don't see Obusua Yamoa on here, but this is where she's been a consultant on this work for us too. And when I really just looked at where people were living, not even where they were shopping, but where they were living and the folks that were able to quit smoking, those that were no longer smoking at follow-up, all the folks that were no longer smoking at follow-up were the ones that were um, not living in historically red line neighborhoods. So the, all the folks that were able to quit were ones that were living in, you know, ones that were um, not part of, not historically red line. So that's, we'll have to look back into that, but that's kind of something that has come up as I was looking at some of the preliminary data. So that's interesting of the role of place in how an intervention for smoking cessation and food access can work. Any other questions for our speakers today? You can put it in the chat or come off mute, whichever is easier for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're happy to, you know, take questions offline as well and um, or talk further about what we've learned. So thank you. Thank you, Jen, Maddie, and Pat for your wonderful talk today. Nice job, you guys. Thank you. And thanks thank everyone you, for everyone. attending. Hopefully we'll see you next month for our next seminar. Thanks, great job. Thank you. We can say this with Sarah. Thank you, good job, Maddie and Pat. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Stop the recording.